So I think I think the 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 relative importance of serendipitous drug discoveries again points towards this idea that quality beats quantity, and it also points to the idea that where possible, where it's ethically acceptable and, and safe, um, one should maybe throw more capital at therapeutic opportunities where there's the opportunity to do decent experimental medicine tests in people. Okay, hi everyone. Um, it is my pleasure today to interview Dr. Jack Scannell, a friend and one of the most rigorous and iconoclastic thinkers in the biopharma world. He's famous for coining the term E-Room's Law with colleagues in a Nature Review's drug discovery paper in 2012, which E-Room's Law is the inverse of Moore's Law, coined for Gordon Moore, a co-founder of Intel, who found that computer processing power doubled every 16 months. We find the opposite dynamic in pharma, where the cost of new drug approvals is rising exponentially. Part of the reason for declining R&D productivity is the bureaucracy and epistemological failings of the current pharma model. He has yet another paper coming out in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery with a coterie of heavy hitting drug hunter co-authors where he reviews the philosophical underpinnings and recent history of drug discovery and uses decision theoretic mathematics to support a simple intuitive conclusion that the quality of your decision tool for example, an animal or cellular model of disease is by far the most important and sensitive parameter in the entire assay cascade, not the number of compounds or any reductionistic target-based properties. In other words, garbage in, garbage out, guy go, quality over quantity. He gives many examples, such as the importance of phenotypic screening for the discovery of antibiotics, uh, natural products chemistry, arguing that our antibiotic discovery decision-making process in 1930s Germany by a small group at Bayer was better than the combined efforts of multiple global big pharmas in the 90s, despite exponentially more knowledge and powerful technologies. This paper should serve as an urgently needed wake-up call to the entire drug hunting world that the animal models of disease that we use are far more important than anyone previously realized. And this is also supportive of the idea that geroprotective lifespan and health span extending drugs employed in aged wild type animals are more realistic and less contrived models than the convenient, fast, but misleading genetic or chemical toxin based models of disease that are widely used today. So um, Jack's background is pretty impressive and diverse. He trained in medicine at Trinity College, Cambridge, he did a PhD in computational neuroscience at Oxford. He was a lecturer at Newcastle University, a pharma consultant to BCG, um, an equity analyst at Sanford Bernstein, and co-head of pharma equity research uh, at the Swiss giant UBS. And he worked in early stage R&D at eTherapeutics and now takes the helm of a new stealth mode startup called Etheros Pharma, working on a longevity promoting Nobel Prize winning chemical class with a novel mechanism of action that has efficacy in many diverse animal models of disease. Healthspan Capital is proudly an investor in Etheros, and Jack is on the advisory board of Healthspan Capital, and he's an advisor to Molecule AG, where I'm also an advisor, a Web3 platform in Switzerland, developing an on-chain marketplace for intellectual property and a factory for building drug discovery DAOs. So, with that, I hope that you enjoy my wide-ranging conversation with my friend, Jack Scannell. Um, I, I've taken a slightly sort of meandering career path. I started out studying medicine, and I, during my medical training, I did a PhD in neuroscience, which was a mixture of sort of wet electrophysiology, sort of recording from cortical neurons, and also sort of computational stuff. And that led into a few years of academia doing pretty much the same thing. Um, I then shifted and I went to work for a consulting firm, a firm called Boston Consulting Group. I was there for a few years before moving into finance. So I became a drug and biotech analyst at a US-based outfit called Sanford Bernstein. And in fact, it was a 
Boston Consulting Group and Sanford Bernstein, actually, I got very interested in R&D productivity, um, partly because of BCG, you know, we were trying to convince our clients we were doing things to help them improve it. Uh, and then partly when I worked in finance and actually looked at the numbers, it was very clear that the improvement weren't happening, right? So I, so I got very interested in that then. I then, around 2012, went back to my scientific roots for a couple of years. I had a bit of time back in biotech drug discovery, doing sort of bioinformatics oriented discovery. I guess if we were trying to fund it these days, we'd call it AI. Uh, we called it bioinformatics at the time. Um, I left there that partly because of concerns I had over the quality of the data that was available at the time. I spent a couple of years then really thinking hard about screening and disease model validity, which I think is going to be the basis of a lot of today's conversation. Back into investment for a few years uh, at UBS, where I ran their or co-ran their European biotech and pharma team. And since 2019, I've been sort of back out on the outside, really focused on screening and disease model validity um, and doing a mixture of sort of academic and commercial consulting work on the subject. Rock and roll. Yeah. So one of the things I love about your background is you're a bit of a jack of all trades and that you've seen the process from many different angles. And you're one of the few people I know who's really like looking from a bird's eye view on the whole system. Most people are focused on their narrow little niches, uh, but you're really taking the broad view and you're kind of taking the burden, taking the responsibility upon yourself and your colleagues on trying to fix the whole system, right? And so um, so I, uh, I, I tip my hat to you, sir, for doing all of that. <laughs> well, well, it's very kind, but I think I've always been interested in puzzles. And I mean, we may talk about this a bit more, but there is a really ugly contrast in biomedical R&D, which is all of the technologies that people think are important have over the last 50 years got hundreds, thousands, billions or millions of times cheaper and better. And it costs, but yet the um, industry productivity declined very steeply from, from 1950 to 2010. I mean, maybe it hasn't declined since 2010, but it's been kind of bumping along, right? So, so you've got this ugly contrast, right? How could you have a process where the inputs get so much better and cheaper and faster and the output just gets more and more expensive? And I think that uh, I've always been puzzled how uh, there seem to be relatively few people interested in that contrast. Yeah, which is insane, right? Because if we could nudge that in the right direction, even a little bit, it would have incredible outsized returns for medicine broadly and, and corporate profits to boot. And, and yet nobody seems super concerned with that, except for a small number of academic drug discovery observers. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, and I think part of the problem is lots of experts have a solution to sell, right? And yeah. if you have a particular solution to sell, you know, if you're a consulting firm, it's all about organizational redesign. Or if you're a high throughput screening uh, provider, it's all about high throughput screening. Or if you're into computational chemistry, it's about computational chemistry. And I think the issue is lots of the problem is there's a correlation between expertise and bias, right? So, so many people who are very expert are focused on the particular solution to the problem that they can offer. Uh, and arguably, particularly the time I spent in investment, um, uh, unlike, like, so there's a sort of joke about consult consultants, right? To be a successful consultant, you have to believe three things, right? You have to believe, one, there's a problem. Uh, you have to believe the problem can be fixed. And then three, you have to believe, but only with your help, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe those three things, you're not a very successful consultant. Now, working in investment, actually, you don't have to believe any of those things. You can believe there's a problem, but you, you're allowed to believe it's insoluble, right? In which case, you just don't own the stock or you don't own the sector. Now, I think many aspects of the drug R&D pr productivity aren't insoluble, but I, but I wasn't required when working investment to have an a priori belief about the solubility of the problem or how it would be solved. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, definitely putting a price on an open mind. So um, on that point, you are coming out soon with a paper, you and your collaborators in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, probably the leading journal in this field. Um, and, you know, I think it's going to be uh, very useful to anyone curious about decision theoretic frameworks for how to do drug discovery better. And um, really, a lot of your focus is on the concept of model validity uh, in computer science, sometimes called garbage in, garbage out. Our quality over quantity, 
um, people seem to recognize today, post hoc, that these models led us astray, like the Mouseheimer's model and amyloid beta world. Uh, but maybe you could tell us a bit about the paper and a bit about your collaborators and, and so forth. Okay, so, so, so about the paper first, I've written about R&D productivity, not a lot, right, but, but, but sort of meaningfully a couple of times in the last decade or so. I wrote a piece in 2012 that was arguing for better diagnoses of the decline in R&D productivity. The, the point behind that paper was, how could it get so much more expensive to discover drugs if the inputs got much better? And it just proposed a number of hypotheses to explain that. Um, I was led, uh, and I won't go through the gritty detail, but I was led a few years later to argue that not all, but a big chunk of the explanation probably lay at the feet of the stock of screening and disease models that were available. And that argument really followed from two things in that paper. It followed from um, some decision theoretic maths that showed that um, if you try and represent model quality as the degree to which the output of your model, if you test a therapeutic candidate, correlates with how well therapeutic candidate would do in people, um, quality beats quantity, i.e. very, very small changes in the degree to which your model output correlates with the human outcome of interest have a bigger productivity impact than tens, hundreds, or even some, in some cases, thousands of times more brute force effort. Right. So that hinted at a possible explanation for this contrast between improving input efficiency and declining output efficiency. And then you could combine that with a kind of historical view, which is, Imagine you have a universe of screening and disease models, some of which are valid and some of which aren't, right? And then you have a drug industry that starts throwing resource at those screening and disease models. Well, what happens over time? The screening and disease models that are valid give us really good drugs. They give us antihypertensives. They give us uh, stomach ulcer drugs, right? Um, and they give us anti-infectives. So what happens is those therapy areas suddenly have lots of drugs, they become genericized, they become commercially boring to the drug industry. So R&D is pushed into those therapy areas where the models are lousy. And because the models are lousy, ironically, they don't retire themselves, right? We keep using them. <laughs> One of the important things that had become exhausted over time was the stock of models that genuinely predict human outcomes uh, across sets of therapeutic candidates, right? And, and that was the work that sort of led me to write the review. And it led me to write the current review for a couple of reasons. One was um, it was rather decision theoretic and mathematical, right? And seemed to be abstract to people. So lots of people sort of read it and said, well, I kind of get the argument, but what do I do differently? <laughs> right. So what I've done is I've been lucky enough to collaborate with a bunch of people who've got huge practical experience of discovering or trying to discover drugs and bring them to market. And that collaboration was so we could do much better on the question, what do I do differently? Right? I didn't want this to be some sort of abstract exercise. Just give you an idea of the people who, who are on the paper. One of, one of the co-authors was a guy called John Hickman. He uh, was professor of molecular pharmacology at Manchester before running cancer drug discovery at Servier. He was part of the team that discovered a drug called temozolomide, which is one of the few, very few chemotherapy agents that worked in uh, uh, glioblastoma. Um, we Duncan Richards, who's a professor of translational medicine at Oxford, used to run a bunch of translational medicine at Glaxo. Um, there's Hubert Trubel, who's a cardiovascular translational medicine expert. He, run a, he ran a bunch of translational medicine at, at Bayer. We've got a psychopharmacologist called Jerry, um, Jerry Dawson, who uh, used to work at Merck, now effectively makes tools for doing translational medicine. And I hope I don't... Um, offend my other authors by not naming them all. But effectively, these are people who've got a huge amount of practical experience in running models, doing translational medicine of various kinds. So what the new review is, it's a, it's a sort of practical attempt to say, well, so what? So what do you do about this idea that model validity is probably more important than you thought? And, and, it, and, and I guess it makes the following points. It, 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 it explains what I think is now consensus that the technological barrier in drug R&D has shifted from chemistry to effectively the tools that tell you whether or not that chemistry is useful, right? So actually, it's not like we can't make compounds. 
We probably can, or in many cases we can, but what we can't do is we can't distinguish the ones that do something useful from the ones that don't, right? Well, it's not that we can't identify targets, we can, but we can't tell the good ones from the bad ones. So the, so the critical resource in drug R&D is probably the, the models, which in the paper we call decision tools, that let you sift the good stuff from the bad stuff. Um, it runs through a bunch of financial stuff that shows model that is really important, right? So it sort of points to the money, it then tries to get around what I think is, is nihilism. So lots of people say in the drug industry I talk to, yeah, we know the models aren't very good, but kind of what else can we do, right? And it has a whole bunch of practical stuff on saying how you evaluate screening and disease models. Because in my view, actually, there's a great many of them are, are largely unevaluated, right? And there's a bunch of practical things you can do to try and at least nudge your model choice in the right direction. Um, you know, so, so, so hopefully it's a kind of practical guide that sort of explains why model validity is important. It gives people some tools and frameworks to think about it. It describes how you can kind of feed that into investment decisions so that the money and resource uh, go towards the models that give you the right decisions rather than the models that give you the wrong decisions. Yeah, it, I envision a day when everyone is talking primarily about how valid is this model, because what I've seen thus far um, in industry and academia is there are these sort of standard models that everyone just sort of accepts as though they were handed down by Jehovah on some mountain. Uh, and, you know, if it works in that model, then it's sufficient to progress because I think there's this perverse incentive structure where academics are happy to just publish papers. They don't care if the model's valid and industry folks on many levels just want to collect their bonus or advance the molecule to the next stage. So it's a box checking exercise, really. Um, so, you know, one of the points you brought up was what what I and we've come to a lot of the same conclusions independently, um, but but we use slightly different language. And, and I refer to this Faustian bargain after Goethe's Faust um, uh, deal with the devil, where, you know, in the 80s and 90s, the industry became fascinated with high throughput things. Um, combinatorial chemistry, high throughput screening, uh, these reductionistic approaches, and then the genomics revolution, where suddenly we got all of these potentially druggable targets, but they were less validated than what had come before. And so there was this, this dominance of the target-based drug discovery approach um, versus phenotypic. And in your paper, you, you highlight some of the work that's come before, like Swinney and Anthony, um, on pointing out that a lot of drugs come from phenotypic screening, even in a period when most of the efforts were target-based. But you go a step further and you say, well, there's this holy war between target-based and phenotypic screening, um, but there are actually other dimensions that we should think about as well, model validity being one of them. So can you riff on that a bit? On the phenotypic versus target-based, I mean, we, we wrote something about that, which I think is interesting. Unfortunately, it's buried in supplementary materials, but and it was triggered by a question a reviewer asked um, about how a sort of model validity view of the world intersected with these results that seem to show you know, differential productivity of phenotypic versus target-based drug discovery. And fortunately, there's a couple of really classic papers in the sort of phenotypic versus target-based drug discovery debate. One is by Swinney uh, and Anthony, I think. The other is by Ada et al. And Swinney and Anthony sort of looking at a slightly earlier time period came down rather more strongly in favor of phenotypic screening. Um, Ada et al, I think, uh, gave a bit more credit to target-based drug discovery. And I went back and looked at these with a kind of sort of model validity um, view. And I think thanks to the papers having such fantastic supplementary material and being so transparent in how they did what they did, I think I came to the view that the distinction that was used in the papers of phenotypic versus target-based actually may be obscuring rather than necessarily elucidating the underlying productivity drivers. And their, their target quality, i.e., you know, how, how good was the evidence about the particular target at the time? Um, another one is chemical tractability, i.e., was it likely that people were starting with the right type of chemistry in the first place? And then the third one is model validity or the quality of the decision tools, um, i.e., did you have the right tools in place to differentiate between the chemical matter that was likely to work and the chemical matter that wasn't? 
Um, and, I, I, and I think those actually may be the fundamental drivers. And it would be very interesting, again, to go back to the original sources and recut uh, the huge amount of work they did on that basis. I haven't done that yet. Yeah, yeah, those were impactful papers. And uh, surprisingly, uh, people haven't really gone back and, and analyzed the realities of drug discovery. They just kind of continue to do what's passed down to them. Um, uh, you and just, just a quick thing. Sort of, the, the interesting thing is that, that again, there was sh in, in both those papers, there'd be huge heterogeneity within what, for example, was called target-based drug discovery. So in Ada's view, something was target-based, as far as I could read the paper, largely based on the beliefs of the discoverer, simply whether or not the discoverer believed they knew the target beforehand, right? So, so these groupings were very heterogeneous, and I think it would be interesting to recut it, um, looking at the actual technologies that were used, the target quality, and also the, the, the strength of the prior conviction about the chemistry. Yeah, an emphasis on believe they knew the target, right? Because drug discovery is littered with examples in which there's some story told about the molecular target, but it turns yeah. out to be something else entirely or multi-target, you know, small molecule, small molecules are small after all, and they bind many targets. Yeah. yeah. But there's actually, as you well know, a revolution going on in, in phenotypic drug discovery because of new tools of target ID, these chemoproteomic methods, yeah. things like SETSA or you know, biochemical pull-down assays improving their quality as well. So, um, so I'm optimistic there. So and, 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 and one area I know a little bit about, I don't want to pretend I know more about it than I do, but I know a little bit about it, is antimicrobials. And I think mm. there, I mean, we wrote a paper in 2016 saying quality beats quantity when it comes to assays, but actually the best thing is quality and quantity, right? So, so if you can get both, that's great. And I, and I do suspect um, in antimicrobials, you've got this kind of conjunction now between effectively cell-based screens for an initial screen and then these very clever methods for working out what the mechanism is, um, which means you can get both quantity and quality. Yeah, we just need to solve the incentive and financial problems in antibiotic drug yeah, discovery. Exactly. Yes. I think the, the, problem problem. Is, yeah, the problem is no longer technical. Yeah. Exactly. Getting reimbursed and so forth. Um, and on antibiotics, I think antibiotics are illustrative for a couple of reasons. Um, there was the uh, the example you gave, you, you had a sort of provocative headline, which was that the model validity used in the 1930s by people like Gerhard Domack uh, in Germany uh, is better than the model validity used in the 90s. And, you know, the early success that we had, the unreasonable success of uh, antibiotics pharmacology has kind of colored the way that we approach drug discovery in general, especially in the oncology field. Um, and so maybe you can elaborate a bit on, on the story, because I think, you know, this paper, like many of your works, are fairly abstract. And I, I believe humans, at least this human, learns better through examples, specific case studies. So could you walk through the uh, antibiotics case? Yeah, so... <laughs> Again, a lot of decision theoretic maths circa 2016 uh, led to the view that model quality beats quantity, right? I.e., it's better to test a small number of therapeutic candidates in a really good model than a very large number of therapeutic candidates selected from the same universe in a model of low validity. And I think the best example of this, certainly I found, is around antimicrobials. Um, so... One of the first useful antimicrobial drugs was discovered in around 1930 by a guy called De Gerhard Domack, who was working at Bayer, uh, and they were screening dye stuff derivatives. And at the time, you didn't have large medicinal chemistry collections, right? And it was laborious to make chemical series. And so Domack, um, in a program which probably tested a couple of hundred compounds, found a drug called sulfonilamide, sold as Prontosil, which was arguably the first or second useful antimicrobial. It was certainly used a lot in the Second World War before penicillin came along. Um, and then between 1995 and about 2005, a number of big drug companies, and Glaxo wrote it up, but, but other companies did it as well, decided to use the new technology of genomics and high throughput screening to try and discover broad spectrum antibiotics. And they had this beautiful sort of rationally articulated cascade, right? Where what you would do is you would look for 
genes that are essential for bacterial survival across a, a wide range of bacterial pathogens, right? You would then make sure there weren't close homologs in people, right? Because those would be then the ideal broad spectrum antibiotic targets. I.e., they'd like they could kill lots of bugs, not be poisonous if you drug them in a human. And then Glaxo and a bunch of other companies ran a hundred plus high throughput screening campaigns, probably tested well over ten to the seven compounds, and. These various companies between 1995 and 2005 found precisely zero compounds that were worth putting into human clinical trials. So the question is, how could one person screening 200 compounds, or not one person, a small team at Bayer screening 200 compounds circa 1930 find something useful when the global pharmaceutical industry between 1995 and 2005 screening 10 to the 7 compounds against 100 targets? Could find that had been rationally identified using genomic methods, could not find anything useful at all. And the answer actually drops out of decision theoretic maths if you look at the trade off between quality and quantity. So if Domax mice, if you, let's say, took an arbitrary set of therapeutic candidates, screened them in Domax mice, and looked at the correlation between the mouse score and the human score, and he was testing them in vivo in mice with sepsis, if the correlation coefficient is 0.8 between a human sepsis outcome, whereas the correlation between your binding affinity or your potency in a high throughput screen and human clinical utility is 0.2, you would expect the best one out of 200 compounds selected in the high validity model to be better in people than the best one out of 10 to the seven compounds selected in the low validity model. And the interesting thing here is it's now known at least some of the factors that would have decorrelated the high throughput screening measures from human clinical utility. And there's probably two broad sets. One is that the genes that are essential for bacterial survival in experimental systems are probably not the same as the genes that are essential for bacterial survival in vivo, right, when they're infecting people. But then another more important one is that high throughput screening collections are enriched for compounds that don't get into bacteria, right? So uh, 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 your target, in that particular case, your, your the results of your target-based screen are very, very heavily decorrelated from anything that's clinically useful, right? So. So it's an example we discuss in detail in the paper, and I think it's, it's, it's certainly the cleanest example I can find where you can kind of map the quality-quantity trade-off onto the, onto the sort of underlying decision theoretic logic. Yeah, nice. Well said. And uh, I'll reveal one of my biases as well. Speaking of molecules that actually traverse cell membranes, um, natural products evolved to do just that, right? So a lot of antibiotics are derived from other microbes because it's chemical warfare out there. Um, and so, you know, we also see this in, in my field, the field of geroscience, biology of aging, and that almost all of the compounds that extend healthy lifespan across species are natural products or derivatives thereof. I don't think that's an accident. Interesting. Um, and so it comes back to this Faustian bargain where, you know, Pharma at the time, and to some extent, still still is uh, primarily enriched in chemists rather than biologists. And so chemists would say, "Oh, well, we can do combi chem, and we can get all of these, you know, millions of planar non natural product looking small molecules and screen those." Uh, and and yet, when it comes to cells or, or or mice, it doesn't work. So I think they're coming around to that and doing sort of natural product like diversity oriented synthesis approaches too but yeah. that's another failure mode and, and by the way um that without wishing to put too many people off that does bring me back to the decision theoretic maths right so i've said mm. model qualities are important but you can think about an r d process right you start out with a universe of therapeutic candidates which are relatively unlikely individually to work right and then you try and sort those candidates out so so you, the probability that you're going to have successful clinical trials is a function of the proportion of useful candidates within your starting set and then your the true positive rate and false positive rate of the decision tools you use to select those candidates, right? So again, the antimicrobial example is arguably one where not only did you have bad models, but you denuded your the starting candidate. The starting candidate set was very heavily denuded in terms of chemical matter that was likely to work in the first place. Exactly. So almost the worst combination would be 
a, a non-diverse, fully synthetic library with just a, a target protein yeah. in a dish. <laughs> and then you have to just overcome all of the hurdles. Yeah, you've got low a priori probability coupled with decision tools that don't differentiate good from bad. Yeah, it's amazing any drugs popped out the other end at all. Um, but the good news is people seem to be waking up to, to the folly of that. Um, and you you brought up a, to, uh, a term, um, target model profile, kind of like target uh, TPP. Um, so can you can you elaborate on this concept? A bit? Yeah, so so I chose the term not necessarily because I'm a great fan of target product profiles, but but because lots of people are, and it's a, and it's a common term, and it makes the idea of a target model profile easier to understand. So, um, I may be being a bit unfair here, but I'm probably not being very unfair to say that a lot of models are sort of validated by assertion, i.e., okay, I want to make a model of disease X. I will put a gene, therefore, in a mouse, and I will then assert that this mouse is a model of disease X, right? Or I want a diabetes model. I'm going to feed some animal more than it would normally be fed, and then I'm going to assert that this animal has now exhibits a model of type 2 diabetes. Now, in many areas of science, we don't sort of accept that kind of post hoc right, argument that because I've noticed that this animal or this system has some of the things that a human with the disease have, that this is therefore a model of the human disease. Right. So the, the idea of a target model profile is you actually start by pre-specifying what a good model would look like. And I've started to do some of this. None of it's published yet, but I started to do some of this with a, one or two collaborators. And the interesting thing is it starts out actually with a hugely detailed survey of the human disease state that you're trying to model. Because unless you thought very clearly about the human disease state that you're trying to model, you can't come up with a target model profile. But the target model profile effectively is a, it's a kind of clever checklist, right, where you have a bunch of criteria that, first of all, reflect the biology of the human disease state that you're trying to recapitulate. Right, so what do you think the relevant aspects of the, of the pathological state are? You've then got a clever checklist that considers things like tests and endpoints. Right? So um, how well do the things that we're going to measure in a human pivotal trial map onto things we could measure in the model? Right? Because actually, it may be that you have a model that really recapitulates human biology, but you're just measuring things wrong. Right? So, and that may be why it doesn't work. There's then a set of checklists around what you might call statistical and experimental hygiene. I think those are the, the parts where arguably there's the biggest literature already, a lot of which comes from the, um, uh, you know, the so-called reproducibility crisis, right? So there's lots of sort of guidance on how you get your statistics and your blinding and your lack of bias right. Um, and so you use that, you, you sort of work back from the human clinical state to, to effectively come up with a clever checklist. And, th and only then do you start deciding whether your models are good or bad, and you align them against the checklist. And, and, and there are a few obvious advantages that you see when you start doing this, right? One is it gives you a sense as to which models might be better and which might be worse. But slightly less obviously, it gives you a sense as to how models might be complementary. So I've been doing some work in the neurodegenerative disease, again, which isn't published yet, where we've evaluated a bunch of rodent models, rat models and mouse models against a target model profile. And what you can then do is you can then do principal components analysis on the models and show that actually the models tile different parts of the sort of disease space that you're trying to model. So you can then say sensible things about combining models if you want to make the screening cascade more informative, right? So, so um, I, again, I think the idea of a target model profile is an important one. It forces you to think hard about the human disease state. And you can't celebrate models as validated simply because you've invented them and then noticed they look something a bit like happens in some people. Totally. Yeah, it's post hoc justification. And you've mentioned this before, um, that uh, the combination of uncorrelated models is very important. So you have different models of the same disease to the extent that they look different. Uh, the better uh, as a backup. There's also another important factor <laughs> that everybody, most people outside of the geroscience field seem to ignore, which is the age of the animals, right? Most 
companies are testing drugs in youngish animals. Yeah. Um, and outside of the rare genetic disease context, that makes no sense because most diseases occur in aged humans. Yeah. So, so this so, is something I'm really pushing for. Yeah. So one of the co-authors who I didn't mention earlier is a guy called Guy Ferreira. And I was very lucky to find him because his PhD was effectively developing frameworks to evaluate animal models of disease. And you're absolutely right that that among the criteria one should look at is, you know, is the does the animal develop the disease at roughly the right age, right? Or with the right comorbidities? And of course, in a great many cases, right? It, it, in, a, in a great many cases, it doesn't. Um, and a, a, another example we talk about in the paper is stroke, right? So there's, there's been a lot of failure in ischemic stroke translation, which actually has been very comprehensively and cleverly and thoughtfully analyzed, right? And again, one of the issues with stroke models is you are generally inducing strokes in young, youngish, healthish animals who, who don't have cardiovascular disease, aren't on a bunch of concomitant medications, right? And they may respond very differently to elderly people who are usually taking a whole host of drugs and have a whole bunch of comorbidities. And you also point out in the paper the role of serendipity in drug discovery. And I often come to that point too, which is, to some extent, treating the molecular biology, despite being a molecular biologist, pharmacologist myself, um, treating it as a bit of a black box because admitting our ignorance about it. And so many drugs come about not from this a priori reasoning about the molecular function of a protein, uh, but just physicians finding that, hey, drug, you know, drug X for indication Y also works for indication Z. Um, you know, and I think most, many of the most successful drugs came about through this happenstance chance discovery, even drugs like penicillin, for example. So, um, maybe you can riff on, you know, how, how, uh, our arrogance, a priori reasoning is, is not as powerful as yes. I, as, I say you've asked the question, actually the reviewers asked as well. And because the reviewers asked it, we've also produced some supplementary material with some speculations on this, but, um, as Jerry Dawson, the author who's a psychopharmacologist, was keen to point out, it's probably the case that every single new class of antidepressant med medication has been discovered by serendipitous observations in people. Right Now, there may be some argument about whether that's true with SSRIs, but, but well, that one you could probably argue the case both ways. But, but that, in my view absolutely matches what the decision theory says. What the decision theory says is quality beats quantity, right? There's only, I think, between one and 2,000 approved drugs, right? There's very few active chemotypes have been released into the wild, right, and, and, and used extensively in people. Yet, that small set of chemotypes has given us probably all of our antidepressant drug classes, right? Now, how is it that actually one could observe that with such low throughput? Right. Well, if quality beats quantity and people with depression are extremely good models of people with depression and you've got a high signal to noise ratio, right, then maybe the decision theory would say it's not that surprising that, that in fact, it may be actually the chemotypes that have an effect on depression are surprisingly common, right? I.e. we're not short of chemistry, but what we're short of is decision tools, right? So the only decision tool that's actually really proven valid has been people themselves with depression, <laughs> right? So I think, I think the, the, the relative importance of serendipitous drug discoveries, again, points towards this idea that quality beats quantity. And it also points to the idea that where possible, where it's ethically acceptable and, and safe, um, one should maybe throw more capital at therapeutic opportunities where there's the opportunity to do decent experimental medicine tests in people. Agreed, agreed. And on this, on the uh, antidepressants front, the best antidepressants are still yet to come in the psychedelics class, uh, or what are some called sometimes called psychoplastogens, which are enhancers of neuroplasticity in the absence of the hallucinogenic effects. It, it remains to be seen whether you can really divorce the trip from the 
therapeutic effects because a lot of it is people going back into their own psyche. But one example of the importance of testing on humans in the CNS psychopharmacology space <laughs> is that most of the phenethylamines and tryptamine class psychedelics uh, were derived from one guy, Alexander Shulgin, this incredible chemist uh, who synthesized hundreds of them and tried them on himself right. and his friends and came up with a sort of systematic way of characterizing their subjective effects and, and then release them into the world. And, and then people sort of over the counter realize that, hey, they're helping with all of these neuropsychiatric issues. And only today are there a handful of clinical trials, actually a lot of clinical trials going on with some of these early uh, chemotypes that are well known. But anyway, so yeah. There's no replacement for the human brain in any model. No, uh, yeah, and again, it'll be very interesting to see how 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 well that turns out. But again, if it does turn out positively, it'll be another example of assay quality, right? I.e., in this case, experimental medicine on people um, uh, uh, beating quantity. Yeah, yeah, and the data are looking better than anything we've seen uh, thus far. And you know, I, I'd, I'd be curious to ask how many groups are already putting this into practice. So you've mentioned Vertex and the company Emulate. Could you just give those case studies? Yeah, so I'll say a bit more about Vertex first. I mean, I don't, I, I only have an outside view of Vertex, right? I read and see what they put into the public domain. <laughs> but it, and again, they use different terminology and I think arrive there differently. But, but it seems to me that their philosophy is very aligned with this idea that actually the, the sort of real risk in drug R&D has shifted from sort of chemistry risk, i.e. or rather the matter that you want to make the therapeutic intervention with. And it shifted to decision tool risk, i.e. Uh, are we going to be able to distinguish matter that works from matter that doesn't? And I think their, their approach, again, although they, they've arrived there differently and use different terminology, is very much focused on let's identify diseases where we think we're going to be able to make the right decisions, right? Even if that means we have to use novel therapeutic modalities, right? And I think that I think that what they're doing is very clear. Uh, I've done some work with Emulate, and there's a paper on BioArchive, which I hope will be coming out fairly soon, which summarises that work. And we've also talked about it. We've done some webinars and stuff, so I can so I can talk about the work. But Emulate are a company that make uh, organ chips. Um, they were spun out of Harvard, I think, by Don Ingber. Uh, and organ chips are an attempt to solve a problem that is evident from cell cultures, which is if you culture human cells, you know, if you take some human liver and you just culture human liver cells, pretty soon they stop behaving like human liver cells. Right, so sure they were once part of a human liver, but don't expect them to behave like human liver anymore. And there's a bunch of ways you can keep them looking and behaving like liver cells for longer, and that involves a number of things. Like you give them certain sort of biomechanical stimuli, um, sheer stress with fluids going over them. You have a mixture of cell types, and if you do that, you can keep liver or indeed other tissues in culture looking and behaving like the native human tissue uh, for a long enough period to test drugs on them, or that is the hope, right? But I think Emulate, like a great many other companies that have these platform technologies, they suffer from at least, or suffered from at least two problems. One is, you may believe that your model has more predictive power, but actually, you, neither you nor your customers have a good way of deciding whether that is true, right? Because everyone who's got a model says it's got more predictive power, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have ever produced it in the first place. And then the second problem is there's no really good financial frameworks for working out how much better predictive power is worth because the typical MPV calculations that people use in drug and biotech valuation are blind to decision quality, right? Now... <laughs> Emulate decided to have a close look at their a chip that they uh, an organ chip that they use to try and predict liver tox, i.e. Like drug induced liver injury. And in this case, it turned out there did exist already what you might call a target model profile. So there's an industry based consortium called IQMPS who effectively published a wonderful paper that said. If you want to validate or evaluate an in vitro system for doing liver tox, 
this is what it should do and this is what it should look like. And it, again, it, it wasn't to target a product uh, model profile in exactly the same way as I do it, but it had the critical features. It said, for example, you know, your liver cells should produce the right amount of urea as, as do liver cells in a human liver still in a human, right? They should produce the right amount of albumin. They should express a whole bunch of genes that we know liver cells express. Uh, they should have the right histological characteristics, right? Um, and importantly, IQMPS also gave a list of drugs, which were toxic drugs and some non-toxic structural analogs. And they said, if indeed your model system is a good model system for drug-induced liver, liver injury, it should be able to distinguish between these more or less toxic drugs. So what Emulate did was a very large uh, uh, study where they ground effectively through uh, these this target model profile from IQMPS tested a whole bunch of more and less toxic drugs and showed they could actually pretty accurately, not perfectly, but pretty well, uh, identify the more versus less toxic drugs. Uh, and then what we, we did is we then did a bunch of financial analysis to try and work out how much better decision quality would be worth you know, to a typical uh, large cap pharma portfolio. Right. So I, I talk about the works again. I, trying to make this less abstract, that emulate study is a very, very nice, really concrete, practical piece of work, sort of gritty tox work, right? Uh, that shows how you kind of implement this approach. Um, so it's a lovely kind of worked example for people who are interested in how you go about evaluating models and the financial value of model evaluation. Excellent. Yeah. So everybody out there, check out this group, emulate. What is do they have an appendix? So, so you, uh, you can find, find it on BioArchive and the and the and the if you, I'm sure if you search for on BioArchive for UART, U W A R T and Scannel. And I'm just going to quickly look up the um paper because I've got it in front of me. It's called Qualifying a Human Liver Chip for Predictive Toxicology. So if you look search on BioArchive for UART, U W A R T, Scannel. S-C-A-N-N-E-L-L, -L, and qualifying a human liver chip for predictive toxicology, I'm sure you'll find it. Excellent. And solving the toxicology issue would, you know, increase R&D productivity by significant margin. I think 20% of drugs fail from tox. Yeah. Now, of course, liver tox is only a part of that. But yes, yeah, liver tox right. is, is one of the biggest ones. But yes, so, so tox is still a big deal. But and it, indeed, arguably, there's some hidden tox failure, because if, to if you're worried about tox, you often underdose. Right. So, so it, it may well be that some efficacy failure is effectively tox failure masquerading as efficacy failure. Good point. Good point. There's the additional issue of um, just broad spectrum efficacy failure. And one way that I personally have decided to address it is <laughs> testing drugs in wild type aging models. So sort of health span models and using normal mammalian aging or aging across different species as an important readout on whether your drug is likely to work in humans, in part because aging, the molecular hallmarks of aging are pretty well conserved across species. Um, and therefore, a drug that extends healthy lifespan across species is more likely to work in man, ultimately. Um, and you're also dosing chronically for a long period of time. And so, you know, you're going to suss out tox signals probably as well. Um, and, you know, this is not typically done because it takes a long time and people don't have ready access to pre-aged mice. But hopefully that will change. And um, I was just a couple of weeks ago at a conference, ARDD, on... Uh, aging and drug discovery in Copenhagen. And your friend and colleague, co-author Michael Rangel from BCG was speaking there. And he pointed out a bunch of big pharma deals with uh, longevity, long, long bio companies, we call them. Uh, most recently, Vita Dow with Pfizer Ventures. Um, and so, you know, pharma seems to be waking up to the reality that we need to be thinking about aging biology. And we can actually use a totally untapped sort of model space, which is, can we enhance resilience in wild type normally aged animals that are a less contrived model than say, engineering in some human gain or loss of function in a rare disease like Alzheimer's, uh, the rare version of it, the inheritable version of it versus the, the sporadic 
platform um, or administering some sort of toxin like bleomycin. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm I'm curious and, you know, you yourself have uh, fortunately uh, taken the helm at a company that has longevity data. And I would qualify your molecule as a bona fide geroprotective molecule through a really interesting new mechanism of action. So maybe you can riff on some of those points. Yeah. So I, I think the first things I'll say is I think your intuition matches some things that I'll put fancy words on, right? Um, which, which is a, a, a way of is a way of saying I agree with much of what you've said. I think there is a very interesting term that comes up when people are thinking about the reproducibility crisis or whether results, biological results are reproducible or replicable. And that's called managed heterogeneity, right? So one thing to ask if you see data from a rat model is, okay, if we do the same thing in a mouse or, or, or even in a different strain of rat, do we get broadly similar results, right? And actually very often you find you don't. And, and I think one thing, and again, I'm not yet an expert on aging models and I don't know if I ever will be, but one thing that strikes me as clear is that actually often compounds seem to work across rather phylogenetically heterogeneous systems, right? And I think, you know, so, so, so I think there's something very different about believing results might be uh, translatable to people. You know, if, if something occurs in a nematode, a fly, and four different mammalian species, uh, you know, a bird and a lizard, um, and yeast, believing that a similar thing might occur in people, that has a sort of a different provenance to just showing that some phenomena exists in one particular inbred strain of rat, right? So I think arguably the sort of aging world has come at this managed heterogeneity sort of in a way that's fortuitous compared to some other, other areas. I think the second analogous point I'd make is I think there's quite an important concept that biologists don't use very much about models, but is used a lot in other fields of science. And I haven't talked about it yet. We talk about it a lot in the paper. It's this idea of what's called domains of validity. Outside of physics, and it probably still doesn't exist in physics, right? Models are not infinitely generalizable. They don't generalize to all possible conditions. A model is a model of something or some things. And Again, though, if it, it, uh, so, so the domains of validity model are the are, is the parameter space within which that model is predictive. And again, I think the more species and the more different organisms that one can show an aging result in, the more likely it is that the domains of validity of those models also extend to therapeutic utility in people. Um, one thing that struck me, though, again, not knowing the field very well yet. My suspicion is that it might be worth going back and doing some reverse translation of the endpoints that are likely to be required if people start doing more human health span trials, right? So it's clear that lots of the animal work is looking at things like maximal lifespan or median lifespan extension, right? I don't think that's going to be the end point in the human trials, at least not in the early ones. It's going to be things like all-cause hospitalization. Now, I don't know what the dog or pig or rat or mouse or drosophila equivalent is of all-cause hospitalization, but with my sort of model validity view, I would urge people to start thinking about what are the animal analogues of all-cause hospitalization and start testing compounds against those outcomes and, and satisfying themselves that those outcomes in mice are correlated with lifespan extension in mice. Because if they're not, again, that's an interesting source of decorrelation between the models and what we'll actually be testing in people. So, I, so, so for health span, I'd actually focus on reverse testing the likely human endpoints in some of the animal models. Agreed, agreed. And let me just pause for a second. Right. So on the topic of health span uh, as a readout, obviously humans live too long to effectively use mortality as a primary endpoint. There are a lot of groups working on epigenetic clocks and blood-based biomarkers. And also this surrogate, which is uh, the latency from first to second morbidity. So when you get sick with one thing, you're likely to get sick with another thing shortly thereafter because it turns out, despite how we train physicians to be hyper-specialized, it turns out that all the organ systems of the body are actually connected. And so when something goes wrong with your kidneys or your brain, something's going to go wrong with another organ system shortly thereafter. And this also explains in part 
the exponential increase in uh, mortality, right? It's an exponential function, right? You, you would expect linear if one thing would go wrong at a time, but it all goes wrong at once and you hit a knee of the curve at some point. Um, so as for the uh, model validity of something like hospitalizations in animals, um, that could probably be done. You could you could just see what they get sick from. You know, mice, it's mostly blood cancers. Uh, but there's another way we can do that, which is kind of like a, kind of like a, a physical checkup. Um, we can see how fast they run, how smart they are. We can do histology and look at the tissues. Um, and there's an organization uh, at the National Institute on Aging led by Richard Miller et al. Uh, called the ITP, the Interventions Testing Program, in which they run a pretty sophisticated multiple thousand mouse study, lifespan studies on drugs that are suspected geroprotectors. And they've highlighted about a dozen of these molecules that reliably extend lifespan in uh, heterogeneous, genetically heterogeneous mice. Um, and so this is really the data that excites me is you have a drug that causes multiple species that are phylogenetically very dis uh, evolutionarily uh, distant to live longer and be healthier and more resilient and robust at the same time. Um, so uh, I think hopefully uh, drug discovery will move a little bit in that direction, but the major impediment is just not enough pre-aged mice and um, people don't currently value that as an endpoint, even though I think it should be the most valuable set of data that you can possibly get, you know, a pharmaceutical that's actually good for you. Um, and this is a big opportunity for, for investors in the space, such as myself, uh, who see all of this low hanging fruit, all of these, these data on drugs that enhance robustness and resilience. And when dosed chronically don't shorten lifespan as most pharmaceutical drugs will do, but actually extend it. And these, these assets are not being valued as they should. So we're scooping up all of those assets. And so we hope that even if the clinical success rate is, you know, 10 or 20% higher than, than the norm. And I think it'll actually be more than that. Um, suddenly you have a very valuable portfolio. So that's sort of the Chero science thesis and the investment side. Yeah. And, and again, I don't think anyone who's looked at the data can help but be struck by how correlated with age risk is of almost not, you know, there's some childhood diseases where, where, where you know, but how increasing age makes you susceptible to nearly everything. Right? <laughs> And again, exactly. as, as, I, as, as I become increasingly middle-aged, you know, I, I, I experience that, you know. But yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's interesting how what a steep slope there is with age and disease risk, which implies there is some underlying principal component. Exactly, yeah, some hidden or latent variable driving it all. Um, and you know, we know on a molecular basis what a lot of these are. Uh, there's a paper called the Hallmarks of Aging, which you know breaks down into nine categories, and it's an incomplete list, but it's a good start. Um, on the molecular damage that causes aging and, and when remedied extends lifespan reliably across species. And I'd love to, to turn to, if you could give the listeners just a, a sneak, tantalizing sneak peek of uh, your new company, which is, uh, you know, by sort of by chance, I would say a longevity company, but you have uh, a chemical class that works across many animal models of disease and including extends lifespan in mice, median lifespan, something around 10%. So uh, can you just tell people a little bit about what you're up to? Yeah, so the company is called uh, Etheros. Um, uh, it was the scientific founders of a guy called Mark Feldman and Laura Duggan. Uh, Mark Feldman, uh, I've known him probably for a decade, but he's best known as the effectively one of the co-discoverers or the discoverer or co-discoverer of the anti-TNF class, right? So Mark Feldman is a very well-known eminent um, immunologist who... Um, knows about discovering and developing and commercializing drugs. Uh, Laura Duggan is a neuroscientist from Vanderbilt who probably for about 20 years has been working on a rather strange class of small molecule enzyme mimetics. Um, the drugs mimic a couple of very important enzymes, superoxide dismutase and catalase. And uh, this seems to intervene actually on a wide range of processes that involve oxidative tissue damage, right? So whether it's mitochondrial leakage or uh, innate immune system activation. Uh, and, and they've been tested in a wide range of models, mainly neural injury and neurodegeneration models, but some others as well, such as a mouse lifespan model. Um, 
And the things that attracted me to it, to be honest, were, um, I think, Feldman, who is a very thoughtful, serious character, and also I think the quality of Laura Duggan's work. So Laura, again, I, I couldn't say that everything's been done according to target model profiles, but Laura is an incredibly serious and conscientious experimentalist. And I, I tend to believe the stuff that she produces more than I believe most of the stuff that is produced. Uh, and it was it were those things really that convinced me to, to get involved. And uh, no, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, and um, yeah, we're hoping to start raising money soon. And we're pleased to be among your first investors. Uh, and yeah, I think the longevity and geroscience world is going to be quite interested in what you're doing, in part because it's a, it's a pretty different mechanism of action than what's come before. Um, so just to, to switch gears a little bit, um, I want to talk about some, some positive news that uh, I, I know you've seen me present before, like at the DSI conference in Berlin, uh, about the clinical trial success rates improving, and you've published on this too. You know, sort of a, a slight respite from from Eroom's law, and and I cite the data from Andrew Lowe um, that basically shows that over the last four years or so, the clinical trial success rate across all therapeutic areas has tripled, <laughs> tripled. And uh, what is Andrew Lowe himself, a professor at MIT? Um, attribute this to, he attributes it to increased academic drug discovery and spinouts. So most of the drugs, the best-selling drugs today, derived from academic drug discovery and biotech spinouts because the incentive structure is less perverse, um, but also attributes some of it to a better understanding of the molecular pathophysiology of disease, you know, going after rare genetic diseases and new modalities as well. But that's only a, a small part of, of the advance in his view. So you've had uh, similar points brought up that you've also published in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery before. Um, can you touch a bit on, on some of this, you know, positive news we're hearing? Yeah, so I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't read Andrew Lowe's recent stuff on this, but I will give you my view about what's happened. So there was a distinct uptick that started around 2010. So between 1950 and 2010, roughly, roughly every nine years, the number of drugs per billion dollars spent uh, by the global biopharmaceutical industry halved in real terms. And by 2010, you were having sort of between 20 and 25 drugs approved a year. Since 2010, the number of drugs approved per year has gone up to sort of closer between, in, you know, somewhere in the range of sort of 40 to 50. And I think uh, I would... Uh, with, with some work I've done with with um, Ringel and the BCG folks, um, I would attribute that to, to a few factors. And again, I'm I'm going to sort of put my some model validity spin on this. Um, I think the first thing, uh, and actually, I'll talk about the things that aren't model validity related first. Right? I, I think the drug industry has kind of learned that regulatory hurdles are lower in certain types of disease. And it's also simultaneously learned quite how much you can charge for rare disease drugs, right? So, uh, um, you know, if you can charge you know, 500,000 or a million dollars a year, it's worth developing drugs for very small populations, often who have no alternative treatments and where the regulatory hurdles are low, right? So I think, I think that's happened. I think the slightly, the more positive spin I would put on it is that there's been particularly in oncology, but elsewhere, <laughs> much better molecular slicing and dicing of disease. And if you have a more accurate disease classification, it is easier to match your model systems to the human disease, i.e. your model is more correlated with the human disease than it would otherwise be. An obvious example, if you, if you think about an ALK-driven lung cancer, right? Well, if you make a generic lung cancer model, your drugs probably won't work. But if you know it's ALK and you can identify the ALK you know, mutant patients, you can make an ALK mutant model, right? And I think that that sort of mapping between models and diseases helps. And then I also think it just happens to be the case that a lot of rare diseases, which are now economically tractable and where regulatory barriers are often low, tend to be monogenetic. And I think monogenetic diseases fit better into the sort of target-based drug discovery model that much of the industry has implemented. Right? So my view is that those sort of things have come together to drive up success rates. It's interesting, though, if you look at things like ICD-9 or the sort of hierarchical disease classifications, 
you can show that the uptick in drug approvals effectively has gone hand in hand with narrow and narrow indications, right? So we may be discovering more drugs, but it's not clear to me that we're providing medical benefit for more people <laughs> with the uptick that we've seen in drug approvals. I haven't run the numbers, but but it's it's clear that in as drug approvals have gone up, the indications to which drugs are approved have become narrow. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this is kind of extremely antithetical to my approach, which is let's treat the underlying driver of the great swath of diseases, which is aging, whereas pharma is very happy to do effectively stamp collecting, you know, turtles all the way down where, oh, you've got a new mutation in, in a new type of cancer, let's drug that. And it will ultimately, that tumor will evolve resistance a couple of years later because you're placing extreme selective pressure on, you know, a small set of amino acids in one protein, almost like the same reason we get antibiotic resistance to drugs, right? You're putting all this evolutionary pressure sometimes patients secured, but really it's not benefiting the vast swath of them. And this is why I actually really like the, the immune oncology revolution, because we're talking about a mutation independent mechanism of action that will apply to, to a great many people by fixing probably one of the major problems that causes tumors to arise in the first place, which is aging of the immune system. <laughs> right. So um, anyway, that's it's it's a little unfortunate that pharma has this sort of really narrow molecular gaze because it's not going to apply to the vast majority of patients. So if you actually looked at how many people were were getting increased qualities, quality adjusted life years from these new uh, drugs, it would probably tell a different story. Yeah, and I, I think there's another interesting point there, which is patients in some ways are probably less heterogeneous than their cancers. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Arguably, therapies that modulate normal physiology, i.e. the patient's immune system, are likely to be more, de more broadly relevant than treatments that try and attack the particular uh, molecular pathology of the cancer, right? Uh, and I mean, uh, Avastin, although it's not a great example because it's not wildly potent, right, is it, another example of that approach where actually arguably what you're trying, you're, you're trying to intervene on the normal um, physiology rather than on the tumor itself, right? So it's a, it's a broadly relevant product, although again, clearly its efficacy is nowhere near, you know, in most cases, its efficacy is not approaching that that you get in some cases with the immuno-oncology drugs. Agreed. Agreed. So switching gears a little bit, um, our mutual friends at Molecule and VitaDAO, these new Web3 enabled drug discovery funding organizations, uh, have, uh, you know, offered a little bit of, of a new approach to funding research and drug discovery that is um, orthogonal to the prevailing paradigms and dogmas in the field. So one of the biggest problems that that I notice, for example, like in the Alzheimer's space is, and there's great reporting on this by Stat News about something about an uh, article called an Alzheimer's cabal that describes how the leading lights in the Alzheimer's field swept under the rug for decades, all of this counter evidence uh, in opposition to the amyloid hypothesis, this idea that there's this one mutated protein amyloid beta or amyloid precursor protein that aggregates and causes sporadic Alzheimer's. And it is, of course, the case that, you know, about 1% of cases of the heritable early onset, very severe type of Alzheimer's dementia are caused by mutations in this gene. And the industry and academia said, therefore, this must be the mechanism that underlies sporadic non-heritable later onset form, which is 99% of cases. Um, and, and we see that kind of logic applying across the board in, in many diseases that are primarily driven by aging. Just as a matter of convenience, academics uh, and, and pharma will use an early onset, extremely rapidly progressing model just to, to increase the throughput of number of molecules they're testing, right? That same central folly. And, and so this is one area where I'm really optimistic about fresh blood coming into the space uh, in the Web3 arena. And examples of that are uh, rare disease DAOs. So you have uh, DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations. 
that basically allow people to pool capital um, and uh, govern this organization almost like shareholders with a token, and they can vote on what is done with that capital. So there are cases where uh, patients and their families with rare acute diseases uh, will pool capital and finance clinical trials for drugs that pharma has no interest in, either because the drugs are generic, non-monopolizable, or the indication the disease population is too small, uh, or for whatever other reason, as well as funding basic research or early stage translational research, for example, uh, Vita Dow with the in the longevity space that just did a deal with Pfizer Ventures and a number of other prominent groups like Apollo Health Ventures, which is the largest aging focused venture fund in the world. And so we have these highly distributed sort of patient driven um, non less bureaucratic organizations funding research that is outside of the traditional dogma. So I'm very bullish on that personally, and I've been supporting some of these groups uh, and, and they're very young, you know, two, two years old or so, and they've already made a lot of progress. And they were just actually covered in, uh, Vita Dow was covered in Nature Biotech in an article recently. So I wonder, you know, you've been advising some of these groups as well, like Molecule in Switzerland. Um, could you elaborate on on what interests you about this space? Yeah, so it, I, so I've got a sort of science background, the kind of markets background. I don't have a Web 3.0 background. And although I've taken interest in them, I probably don't know as much about DAOs as I should. So I'll tell you what interested me. Um, there's two sort of fundamental things, really. One is that I think the history of pharmaceutical innovation is sort of rewritten through the lens of bottom-up push, when in fact, user pull is much more important than people think. So if you look at the... So, so I've sort of argued in the past that... that People looking at pharmaceutical innovation make exactly the same logical error that creationists make when they look at the eye, right? They look at the eye and say, this thing looks so beautifully designed. How could it possibly have evolved, right? Well, it's, there's something the same with drugs, right? Every drug that is ever launched has this kind of beautiful, molecularly rational discovery myth, right? And And... Part of the reason that's true, rather, and what people forget is that the nine out of 10 drugs that go into clinical trials have equally plausible molecular discovery myths, um, and they don't work, right? Which suggests that molecularly rational discovery myths are not very predictive. And the heavy lifting is really done in the clinic. And there's a lot of sort of historical support for that. And there's a wonderful paper by a guy called DeMonaco um, on user-led innovation in pharmaceuticals. Uh, so, so that was one thing that got me interested, that the infrastructure around pharmaceutical R&D is very heavily oriented towards the sort of molecular discovery myth model. It's where the attractive intellectual property lies. It's where you can get you know, tax subsidies. It's where government puts money. But lots of the heavy lifting is done by users, user-led innovation. And it would be good to formalize and make easier some of those structures that support user-led innovation. The other thing that got me interested was around transaction costs. So again, without knowing a huge amount about DAOs and, and, and Web 3.0, um, it's clear that the, the costs of even evaluating the vast bulk of university-created IP are high using the conventional approach versus the expected value of that IP. So, i.e., there's a huge amount of stuff that could be traded and might create value, but isn't traded and doesn't create value because the transaction costs are too high. So it's a bit like an eBay for IP, right? You 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 create value not by making current markets a little bit more efficient. You create value by making markets exist where none previously existed, right? So lots of you know, arguably outside of a few heavily ventured universities, universities are terribly underventured. And also the people at those universities don't have the right tools to present their material in such a way that it could be ventured. So it struck me that providing sort of low cost, low transaction cost, standardized platform to make effectively an eBay for, for, for IP might be an extremely valuable thing to do because you could create markets where none existed. So those are the things that got me really interested in it. Agreed. Same here. And um, having been in the trenches for some years, 
banging my head against the wall, interacting with tech transfer offices, which have perverse incentives and academics who really often don't know that much about the drug discovery process or clinical indication selection or the commercialization strategy. Um, just having an organization that fills in that so-called valley of death, where you go from academic drug discovery to actually spinning out a new co. That is, I think, the greatest bottleneck in the process. Um, and so there's this, there's this gap for funding these killer experiments or really early drug discovery. Maybe it's a high throughput screen or some medicinal chemistry that it's hard for academics to get NIH grant funding for. Um, and so, and it's not as glamorous, right? You're probably not going to get a Nobel Prize for some, you know, medicinal chemistry work. Um, and so, you know, filling this gap is just an incredible unmet need in the market. And it can be potentially really valuable because there are excellent validated targets and early stage assets sitting on the shelf in these underventured universities all over the world. And that's something that's cool about these DAOs, which is they're global in nature. DAOs actually don't have, they're not incorporated in any one jurisdiction. So it's easy to hire people, even who want to work full uh, part-time anywhere in the world. So for example, in the Vita DAO case, we have professors and drug hunters and biotech entrepreneurs all over the world. And maybe they have a day job, they're doing something else, but they're really passionate about something and they're world experts in some niche. And so, you know, just, you know, several hours a week of their reviewing these projects and giving pointers uh, creates this really effective sort of analysis diligence process, not to mention that DAOs themselves are, are scalable. So there are actually over 5,000 or 7,000 people who are members of Vita DAO, Longevity DAO, um, who are sourcing assets from all over the world, whether it's assets tied up in biotech companies or big pharma shelves or um, university uh, tech transfer offices. And then furthermore, there's another point, which is um, tech transfer offices have you know, patent applications or, or patents that are starting to go stale and they're trying to transact those. They're trying to, you know, be like investment bankers finding buyers. Um, but actually there's a whole, there's a whole dark matter in the universe of R and D uh, or, or beneath the surface of the iceberg, which is great translational research projects that are pre patent. So you basically you have a grant application that is maybe too translational too practical and drug discovery oriented for the NIH, you submit it to one of these DAOs like Vita DAO. And we do, you know, 250k half a million dollars worth of early stage translational R&D to get it to the point where a venture fund is interested in building a company around it or Vita Dow spins out their own company as uh, they did recently. We did recently um, a couple of weeks ago with Vera Gorbanova's lab is one of the leading aging researchers. Um, and so this, this really excites me because I just see how inefficient the market is in new co-spin outs. Uh, there are really probably less than 50 big uh, competent company building biotech venture funds out there. And there's just this dearth of experienced drug hunters who, who want to take the helmet, you know, such an early stage project. And then another nice um, promising trend is the aggregation of these single assets, uh, what I've termed a snack, single novel asset company, into <laughs> <laughs> you like that one, into um, into a, a larger diversified portfolio, usually around some kind of theme. Uh, and, and this is a term I also coined in 2019 called a disco, a distributed drug discovery company, sometimes called a hub and a hub and spoke model. An early example of this is Bridge Bio, which was spun out uh, with the help of um, Andrew Lowe at MIT and Third Rock Ventures and Neil Kumar et al., um, where you, you have some thesis, some broader thesis, and Bridge Bio is rare diseases that we understand the underlying biology, and there are all these great academic assets sitting on the shelf that pharma was not interested in at the time. Now they're interested because of all the regulatory advantages. And one of the companies that I co-founded a couple of years ago is called Cambrian Biopharma, which is today one of the largest, if not the largest, um, aging-focused multi-asset platform companies, you know, raised over 160 million, et cetera, with 20 assets in the pipeline. And you can basically get this premium, this, this portfolio premium on aggregating a lot of uh, single asset snacks into an umbrella company that has shared services at the top co level um, and 
And in so doing, you can attract top talent because top talent, they're not going to leave pharma for one highly risky snack company, right? But they would be more likely to do it in a portfolio model where if you have 20 plus assets in the portfolio, diversification is the only free lunch in finance. And therefore, they're more willing to, you know, yeah. um, hitch, hitch to that wagon. Yeah. So anyway, these are some of the hopeful trends around organizational structure. So you've got the disco model of aggregating assets and basically you know, the argument has been made, well, you know, big pharma does that, right? You know, Novartis or Roche will have 50 clinical assets in their portfolio or 20 at any given time. Um, but the problem is, and this is sort of an open secret that nobody seems to realize other than people in pharma, big pharma doesn't do much R&D at all. It actually does D, which is late stage clinical trials. And big pharma spends less than half of revenue on R&D uh, as compared to marketing. So they spend double on marketing what they spend on R&D. Uh, Novartis and Roche are the highest at about 15% of revenue. Uh, Pfizer is only 3% or so. Um, and uh, so the, bo the bottom line is there's this huge gap. Nobody is doing early stage drug discovery anymore. And so it's rest, you know, it's coming onto the shoulders of these academic spin outs, um, which are these, you know, nimble, effective groups, but uh, you can't really attract top talent to join a snack, a single asset company. And so I think this disco model of aggregation can help solve one of those problems filling in the gap of early stage distributed R&D that pharma is no longer doing, um, as well as these DAOs, which get in the really early stage uh, aspect of that, which is those killer experiments that are maybe a little bit too early to do a spin out around. So anyway, I'm, uh, I'm very optimistic about, you know, the next decade of drug discovery because of these trends, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts. I, I, I hadn't thought about those structures very much. I, um, yeah, I haven't really thought about this in terms of. Yeah, I haven't really thought about this in terms of things you just said, but they did strike me as resensible, right? So, so yeah, I can see. And I, th I think the the single asset company thing, right? You, you're absolutely right that the that there's a whole bunch of advantages, but actually, there are, you, you've got these. Dis you know, you don't have any economies of scale or scope, right? And if you know. Even a full, yeah, you know, even a full time CFO, right? You're not going. There's lots of things you don't need if you're a single asset company. It's just not enough. There's just not enough stuff going on to keep busy a lot of the expertise that you actually need periodically, right? So it does strike me as uh, eminently sensible and a sort of an, 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 an obvious organizational solution to to that problem. Yes, and to date, people have used consultants. <laughs> And consult consultants can be great, but they don't have skin in the game. And also, there's all sorts of costs associated with sourcing them, right? So, for example, you don't know if they're going to be any good or not. You know what I mean? Like, a consultant is fine once you've worked with them a few times, you know they're good. But you, you might get someone who's not very good or, you know. So, I think the problem you have, yeah, I think as a single asset company is you you, you end up doing lots of things for the first time. Or, or the risk is you do too many things for the first time. And the first time you do everything, even if you actually end up doing it well, it takes you much longer than the second or third or fourth or fifth time you did it. So I think that kind of level of expertise is probably very helpful to have in a central body to then support the individual asset companies. Exactly. Yes. At pooling those shared resources across multiple assets. And there's a term, I think your management consulting comrades at McKinsey came up with uh, institutional learning, right. which is, um, you know, if you're a single novel asset company, a snack, and the, it fails in clinic, uh, you know, the team basically disappears to the five corners of the earth, and you lose a lot when you do that, right? You built a team that knows how to work together. You've got this institutional knowledge about the target or the molecular biology underlying the disease, and it just goes away. Uh, that's and there's lots of gritty detail. So that even if you document things really well, it's impossible. It's, it's almost impossible to document, right? So, so, I, and I've seen that. You know, when sort of technical people leave teams, even if you've got good documentation incredibly valuable knowledge goes out the door that you can't really recover. Yeah. Noam Chomsky calls this tacit knowledge. Yeah. Um, and yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the disco does certainly solve that, that problem. The main challenge with the disco though, is <laughs> you have to um, start with a lot of capital. And for most entrepreneurs, the model is built on raising small quanta of capital periodically when you hit milestones. But with a disco, 
you need a certain level of critical mass. So you need one of those not quite mega rounds that we're seeing in venture, but you need tens of millions just to yeah, get yeah. up and going. Yeah. But once you have that momentum, um, you are you are on track to potentially build, you know, the next cell gene or amgen or whatever, right? If you have one big success because of the power law distribution, yeah, uh, you can reinvest that capital into building a really sophisticated organization and then grow from there. Um, so I've, you know, the disco model seems to be working pretty well, uh, but it's still early days. But I think we need a lot of uh, institutional restructuring. And then furthermore, is another issue, which um, pharma colleagues uh, will will acknowledge, you know, qu quietly over over cocktails, which is the industry has become cartelized. So they keep gobbling each other up, almost like OPEC is a cartel for oil. Um, when you have less and less competition at the big pharma level, um, there's more bureaucracy and there's less incentive to actually innovate. And so one of the reasons it is said why pharma has been forced to raise prices so much on these drugs, including like insulin, which is really, there's not much innovation going in insulin, is because they're not innovating. If they were innovating and they were getting more blockbuster drugs more frequently, they wouldn't need to charge so much to make up for all of the failures. And so pharma comes out with these numbers from industry aligned think tanks like at Tufts saying, oh, you know, it costs a billion dollars to get a drug approved or their recent estimate is, I think, 2.8 billion or something like that. And that includes, you know, half of that cost is the cost of capital, you know, the time uh, and interest rate basically required. Um, but most of it is just sort of a back calculation from all right, we've tested this many drugs and we spent this amount on R&D over that period. Therefore, you just do the division and therefore that's what it costs to get a drug approved within that organization. But all that tells you is how inefficient Big Pharma is at internal R&D because the NIH, Health and Human Services, come out with data on actually what it costs to run these clinical trials and what it costs on average to do the preclinical R&D. And, you know, it's well under $100 million per drug, right? So if your failure rate is 90%, yeah, it'll cost you a billion dollars approximately. Um, but there's no reason why the failure rate needs to be 90%. That's the bottom line. And I think targeting the biology of aging can increase that a bit. And then improving model validity, which is tied to using aging models, will help. Um, but yeah, I, I wonder if there's any any other sort of approaches we can take to improve the success rate. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the success rate for a moment, but I do think there is a good analogy for drug pricing. We, now, or rather, I think the drug pricing debate is interesting because um, the people who most of the people who are interested in are not particularly motivated to sort of tell the truth, right? So if you're a drug company, it, yeah, so, so in my view, you know, drug companies charge what the market will bear, but that's quite unpleasant to say. Um, and so you sort of you create other arguments which are not very good arguments. But it, but it is the case that um, the R and D follows the money, right? So uh, uh, there's a very you know so so you know roughly between you know possibly more than forty five percent of the global drug pipeline is oncology focused, and. That's because high prices suck in the capital, right? So, um, and arguably, the capital is not being sucked into the most use, socially useful areas. But I think the economics of the drug industry resembles a little bit the economics of a gold rush, right? So, you, you, what happens is very high prices in certain areas suck in lots of R and D investment which effectively then depress the returns of the players. So, you've got this rather strange situation where prices are incredibly high. <laughs> But actually, the R&D competition is so intense that people are not making good returns. So it's, 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 it's a sort of, it's, it's bad for everyone, right? Or, or it won't or argue, but it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's a sort of rational response by the industry to, you know, pecu peculiarities of pricing power that once established, naturally, they're very keen to sustain. Agreed. And while we're dunking on big pharma, um, there's another issue, which is they all pile in after the same targets, mechanisms of action, once there's clinical proof of concept, right? Like look at the PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors, for example, class, um, you know, there's one success uh, and then they all have their Me Too version of it. And this is rational from a pharma perspective, right? Because if you can improve slightly, 
either in actual efficacy or safety or just in the marketing of one of these drugs, uh, you can, it's a winner take all sort of uh, marketplace. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would struggle to say actually some of the current behavior is rational. So in an economic sense, so I, so there's a wonderful paper pro- published probably four or five years ago now by a group of people that evaluate pharma, John Moser and others. And what they did is they looked at the number of candidates in clinical development for various diseases, and then they applied historic success rates to those candidates. And I can't remember the details, but you come up with some very peculiar, some very peculiar results. Like, you know, like if you look at all of the candidates currently in clinical trials for breast cancer and you apply historic success rates or, you know, Hodgkin's lymphoma, you will get, you would expect to have 30 or 40 drug approvals over the next five years. Now, that may, may be great for breast cancer patients, but, or Hodgkin lymphoma or non Hodgkin lymphoma patients. But it suggests to me that asset progression decisions are dominated by technical considerations and the technical risks have arguably gone down, right? And what they're, they're not sufficiently cognizant of is the new competitive <laughs> risks that uh, are presented by the fact that everyone is just basing their investment decisions on technical concerns. Because, you know, maybe we get 20 new breast cancer drugs or 30 new breast cancer drugs, but I tell you what, there aren't going to be 30 companies making good returns on them. And I don't know if health systems could necessarily absorb that level of uh, change, right? So, so, so uh, yeah, I, I am puzzled by the current crowding in, in certain therapy areas from a sort of, if I put my old equity analyst hat on. Agreed, yeah. It, it doesn't seem rational to go after the same targets uh, or clinical indications, but it's just perceived as low risk. And pharma, you know, they pay a 5% dividend and the shareholders expect a certain rate of growth. And so, you know, if you can have a portfolio where some of your assets are low risk and you have a couple where you're swinging for the fences, they see that as rational. But from a public health perspective, absolutely not, right? Because all of the best minds are focusing on these relatively trivial problems and incremental improvements. And then even in in an indication like Alzheimer's... Well, where- well, arguably, the best minds are focusing on historical accidents of pricing power, right? So had the current pricing model been different we wouldn't have everyone working on oncology, right? They'd be working on something else. Exactly. And, and I think, you know, it's always puzzled me because oncology is not the leading cause of death or disability. It's cardiovascular disease, cardiometabolic disease by far. Um, And, you know, it's a lower bar for approval for cancer drugs. Uh, You know, toxicity is allowed. Uh, You don't, you know, you don't need that much overall survival. You can just have shrinkage of tumors for conditional approval. Like there are all these reasons why, Uh, Pharma is happy to just keep pursuing oncology, but it really leaves a a lot of huge societal unmet need, including in the CNS space. I mean, you've noticed over the last decade or so, pharma has has one by one just totally pulled out of the CNS space entirely. And the longer they do that and the more knowledge accumulates about the underlying biology of CNS disease, the more interesting new approaches sit on the shelf that can actually by, you know, risk loving VCs or, or company founders actually get those in the clinic. And this is actually the story that happened with checkpoint inhibitors. So there's an excellent documentary I recommend everyone see uh, called Breakthrough about the Nobel laureate Jim Allison, uh, UT Southwestern, who <laughs> for about 10 years was trying to get pharma to pay attention to CTLA-4, one of the hottest drug targets around. And, you know, he's banging on their doors. They wouldn't listen. And then it was with a small biotech company, Metarex, that they finally showed some clinical proof of concept and then everybody piled in. So in a sense, it's good for VCs and company founders that pharma is so dropping the ball, but it's really bad for society as a whole because there are there is not a very good infrastructure for company formation and small biotechs. And there are really a limited number of people capable of doing biotech entrepreneurship, right? Uh, It's not a topic that's taught in universities. Uh, It's quite niche. So hopefully we can find some ways to get more talent and capital into the earliest stages of drug discovery. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Cool.